So thank you very much for interview, Mr. Mitchell. So please tell us why the political process in Georgia still has different approach in the West. Well, it's understood differently in the West for a few reasons. One is that the, the West was very invested in seeing the previous government as democratic. Therefore, to see the election that just happened as anything other, as, as a simply one side won an election, thus proving that Georgia was always a democracy, is consistent with the view that the U.S. particularly has always had in Georgia. It may not be consistent with the facts, but, never, but, but the facts and, and, and the theory are two different things here. Um, so, so that's, that's one piece of it. It's easier for the West to understand it that way. If the West understands this as a democratic breakthrough, which I argue that it is or at least has the potential to be, then the West has to go back and say, hmm, our policy was wrong in Georgia, our assessment of what was, of, was wrong in Georgia, and they don't want to do that. So that's the first thing. The second point is that the old government has been better at telling the story than the new government. So for a good I'm estimating three months after the election, the sitting Georgian ambassador to the U.S., to take the most extreme example, was out there telling a very clear story about Saakashvili, about Ivanishvili, that was not necessarily consistent with the facts, but was consistent with what the U.S. wanted to hear and with what the old government wanted to say. Whereas the new government has not been very aggressive in seeking to message those things to the West. Over the years, the West has supported Georgia through different programs. So, but 2012 uh, Georgia election reveals the challenges ahead of for the West democracy promotion efforts. Why is this happened, and how Georgian government should improve this gap? Well, I would begin by saying you would begin by saying over the, over the years. But it's important to remember that the Georgia-U.S. bilateral relationship and bilateral alliance began under Presidents Shevardnadze and Clinton. This is a long relationship. It, it far pre predates Saakashvili, it far predates Bush, let alone Obama and Ivanishvili. Second piece of, of your question, look, this question of what the, how the U.S. is doing democracy promotion is not only relevant in Georgia, it's a real challenge all over the world. You can look in neighboring countries uh, of Georgia, for example, Azerbaijan, where the U.S. has put millions of dollars into democracy promotion and has very little to show for it. You can turn on you know, the CNN or put on the front page of most websites and see what's going on in Egypt, a country where two years ago we were, we were pronouncing a great democratic breakthrough. And today, regardless of the interpretation of your, the events there, that democracies on the march in Egypt is not the conclusion to which you would arise, to which you would arrive. In Georgia, there's a specific challenge, which is to me that, 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 that I believe the new government really is back to square one of democracy building in Georgia. They came to a power by winning an election which the existing government really in which the existing government really created a lot of fraudulent aspects but they still managed to win they took power in a country where there have been some steps forward for democracy but minimal steps so you had a reduction of petty corruption for example but you had a concentration of power in one person again which we still have in Georgia by the way we had a weakening of institutions in, in the name of informal power which is always a problem in countries like Georgia and we had a, a elite and high-level corruption, as well as a kind of abuse, a culture of abuse uh, at the hands of the government. And I'm not saying the worst culture of abuse or the worst you know, authoritarian regime, but a culture that was not democratic, all of which need to be addressed if Georgia's going to become democratic. Now, that's a daunting challenge for a gover any government of Georgia, but it's, it becomes more daunting for this government of Georgia because the West is invested in not seeing it that way. So just by contrast, after the Rose Revolution, the West came into places like Georgia, the U.S. and Europe, and said, wow, we really have a lot to do here, but we have some momentum, we had a good outcome. Whereas now the West is coming in and saying, we've accomplished a lot. Hey, look, there was an election, and besides, we don't really like these guys as much. Or we're not really confident about these guys. Now, and that creates a harder challenge, but let me just be clear there. That's not the entire view in the West. That's certainly the view on the kind of right wing of European and American politics. But if you look at increasingly the, 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 the statements from the, state, from the U.S. State Department, the statements from the U.S. Embassy in Georgia, you see something different. There you see statements that are beginning to recognize what's really going on in Georgia and to recognize that this is the new government of Georgia and they need to work with them and that this new government is more than happy to work with the U.S. So, so I think this problem is getting better, but it's getting better very, very slowly. 
So do you think the recent political developments in Georgia raise questions about how the West missed an important development in the region and about how the long-standing methods of democracy promotion have lost their meaning, particularly in the former Soviet space? Well, those are, those are two different questions, but yes, I do. Um, and, and it's not just in the former Soviet Union, it's certainly not just in Georgia. So this is a bigger picture question about democracy promotion. But in my view, one of the most, one of the assumptions underlying the kind of post-Cold War democracy promotion is that we, the U.S., or we, the U.S. and Europe, work with countries that want to become democratic to help them do that. Now, if you're sitting in Poland in 1992 or the Czech Republic in 1993 or you know, Hungary in 1993, that, that is actually true. Increasingly today, that's not true. Many countries that are not democratic are, are not democratic because they don't want to be democratic. That was true of Georgia under Saakashvili, but it was, they did such a good job of presenting it that way, presenting themselves as democratic, that the U.S. didn't see it that way. But even if the U.S. does see it that way, we don't have any new tools at our disposal. So if you look at U.S. democracy promotions in, in countries that we would recognize as authoritarian or at least clearly non-democratic, it's the same battery of tools. It's support for civil society, it's support for parliamentary development, it's helping political parties, it's trying to make elections better. Now, all of those things are important. And taken on their own, they're all valuable. If you live in an authoritarian country, having foreign support for civil society is important, right? Because otherwise there's no money for anything, right? Having foreign countries draw attention to unfair elections is important. But the problem is it doesn't add up to enough. It doesn't add up to bringing democracy. The other, another way to look at it is that the battery of programs which undergird U.S. democracy promotion are technical in nature. We work with the legislature to show how to have a committee hearing that's more open or that's more transparent or with more accountability, just as an example. Now, that's important because without those things, you can't really have a functioning legislature, right? So that, I'm not saying those aren't important, but the fundamental problems in many countries are political. So you have a technical approach to a political problem. Now, if you look at Georgia, in my view, since the election, so it's the kind of Georgian dream govern Georgia, to me, I don't know what the answer is here. Because I don't know, in, in, my, in my view, this election didn't prove that Georgia was a democracy, nor did it mean that Georgia was jumping forward towards becoming more democratic. What it meant to me was that the possibility of, a, of, of, of democracy in Georgia was still alive, whereas I felt that in a UNM victory, which would have consolidated uh, the semi-authoritarian UNM rule, would have precluded democratic development. So in Georgia, the book is still open, but we don't quite know what it says yet. So Saakashvili's so government has strong support from the right-wing European and American politics. Does it mean that most in the West we are unwilling or are willing to see the problems of democracy in Georgia, despite of different uh, reports from Freedom of Ho Freedom House or different? Well, I mean, you know. The, the reason for, Sakish, for the support for Saakashvili in the, in the, on the right in the U.S. and in, in Europe had very little to do with democracy in Georgia. It had to do with two things primarily. First, the, 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 the extent and power of the personal relationships which were cultivated by Saakashvili and his, and his team in Georgia with, with those right-wing groups in the U.S. and Europe. And that was done through personal relationships. It was done through saying the right things ideologically, through this kind of um, strong commitment to libertarian, at least in theory, to libertarian economics, liberal economics, which, which resonated with the far right. And it also uh, had to do with, with Saakashvili and his government's strong anti-European rhetoric, anti-Russian, pardon me, anti-Russian rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, and then it got filtered through the, the kind of the way American and European politics work, where the right wing used Saakashvili as a way to criticize the left and to show that if you, if you really oppose Russia, which if you are on the right in America or the Europe on foreign policy, you have to do, then you can show this by your support for Saakashvili. So it became a kind of political tool here. And particularly if you look at the U.S., support for Saakashvili, the, the, the U.S. government under Obama, the, the federal government under Obama, the executive branch was criticized by the right wing in Congress. I mean, not a lot. It's not a huge issue because they were not hawkish enough on Russia. And the proof of that was, look, you're not as supportive of Saakashvili. Of course, the irony is that the Obama administration was very supportive of Saakashvili, certainly financially and certainly politically. Ultimately, they were not 100% supportive in that they didn't allow him to, to get away with stealing another election, but they were pretty supportive. So since the victory of Georgian dream, not much has been known in the West uh, about what Bidina Ivanishvili wants to do and intended to do. Can you explain the major reason why Ivanishvili's election has not been viewed 
with the same interest as it was with Rose Revolution? There are many reasons for that. Some have to do with Georgia and what happened in the election. And what happened after the election? Ivanishvili did not come here and immediately begin telling a story the way Saakashvili did. Um, Ivanishvili is not a figure that is going to be resonate so quickly in the U.S. as Ivanishvili. As, as Ivanishvili is older than Saakashvili. Ivanishvili does not speak great English. Frankly, he speaks better French than English, which in the U.S. is a, is a bad thing. Um, he made a lot of money, and he made a lot of it in Russia. He is, but as opposed to Saakashvili, and you would think that the capitalists would like the guy who made a lot of money. This is the only billionaire we don't like. Um, but, I mean, I like him, but, but that, that, that our government doesn't like. As opposed to Saakashvili, who is a product of all of those programs that we're so, that are their important programs, the Muskie program, civil society programs. So he's of that world where he's a young man who speaks English and knows how to talk to Washington, their language. Not literally the English language, though that's part of it, but the language of NGOs, the language of U.S. foreign policy. So he's a much better fit in that regard. Now that's one piece of it. Second piece of it is that the world has changed. The Rose Revolution was nine years, occurred essentially nine years before this election. During that time, what's happened? Well, we've seen all three color revolutions fail to bring democracy. We've seen the kind of heady days of the, of, the post, of, of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq where we were talking about democracy in those places give way to a, at least among many Americans, a consensus that we've kind of failed there. We've seen Egypt, which in 2010 and the Arab Spring give way to, so, so it's not a moment where we look around with great hope and say, aha, this is, we're not looking for democratic breakthroughs because we're not primed to see them. So soon there will be presidential election in Georgia yes. in October. So what should be expect, what we should expect from this election and how much success, successful will be Georgian Dreams candidate, Mr. Mokolashvili? Well, I don't quite know what, what the Georgian people should expect. I know what the Georgian people should demand, which is a free and fair election. This, is, this to me is very important. Um, and a free and fair election regardless of the outcome. Now, if you... And they should demand that the, the same American and European organizations that observed the last one observe this one. And the same domestic organizations in Georgia that observed the last one observe this one. This, the Georgian Dream has said just recently that, that they want this to be a free and fair election. That's great. And, but it doesn't, if it's free and fair and no one notices, it doesn't matter. So the world should look here. Uh, my sense, as a, if I were kind of as a horse race angle here, is I think Mark Vilashvili is going to win. I think he'll win handily. I think it's actually an intriguing choice. Uh, to me, it's a much more interesting question. Who is the UNM nominee? How well does that person do? Is there, you could easily see a scenario where, let's say, it's Mark Vilashvili wins, and there's a clear second place finisher, and that could be someone like Bakradza if he were the nominee of the party. And then there are all these other people like Borjanadze and Vilashvili down here. But if the gap, it almost doesn't matter who, with the gap between one and two. What matters is the gap between two and three. Because if the UNM candidate can get 25% in this election, they are a political force to be reckoned with in Georgia. Yes, they've lost an election or two, but they're not done. They have a base of support. They have an ability to get those voters out. And they need to be, and, and that, in my view, that's good because we need not just a multi-party, but pluralist political system. If, however, let's say they can't break 15% in the polls, and let's say Mark Vilashvili ends up north of 75%, then you see the beginnings of a return of a one-party system. And the, 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 in some sense, the biggest challenge of Georgian politics in the almost quarter century since uh, independence and the collapse of the Soviet Union has been the, 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 the uh, 